Uh, my name's Jonathan, and uh, tonight they let the crazy man out of the basement. So I'm upstairs with you. It's good to be with adults praising Jesus for a change. So not that I don't enjoy praising Jesus with your middle school and high schoolers. It's a blessing and a privilege. So um, welcome. If this is your first time at Gravity Church, we're going to lock the doors. No, just kidding. Uh, you're in the right place. You stumbled in here at just the right time. Uh, God's word says that at just the right time, God sent his son to die for us. And so God is right on track in your life, wherever you are right now, so we can trust him this evening. So we're going to pray, and then we'll get started. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here in your presence tonight. Father, we thank you that you love us unconditionally. We thank you that even though we rebel against you, even though we reject you, you still call us to be a part of your family. And Father, I pray that as we continue to explore <clears throat> the love that the Father has for us tonight, I pray that our hearts would be softened, that our hearts would be moved, and God, that ultimately we would respond to the invitation of your love, your mercy, your grace, and your redemption in our lives. We love you, we praise you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. So uh, we're going to review real quick, but if you want to get ahead of the schedule, turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. That's where we're going to start tonight. Um, so a couple weeks ago, Jason started talking about the Father's love for us, right? The Father's heart. And uh, raise your hand if you've been moved by this discussion. If, you, if your perspective of God in heaven has been changed because of what we've been talking about, right? And so it's a, it's a beautiful picture, and like most of you, I grew up in a home where things weren't great with my father, with my family, right? And so when I became a Christian, when I gave my life to Jesus, right, it was a challenge. All these analogies about the father was difficult because my father worked two full-time jobs and wasn't there. And so I had to fend for myself. I had to take care of myself. There was nobody taking care of me. Um, and so this process of understanding who God is, who he says that we are, and how he calls us is really, really important, like Jason's been talking about. Um, God wants us to be a part of his family, right? We started a couple weeks ago talking about how God calls us to be a part of his family. And then we looked at how uh, Jesus himself explained to the people that uh, we are so valuable, each and every one of you are so valuable, that you're like a precious coin that gets lost and he goes searching for it or a sheep that's part of a sheepfold that gets lost and he goes and looks for it and every single person that gets lost he does that and then we looked at how God receives us back so as we're you know knuckleheads out in the world raise your hand if you're like me right I love preaching at Gravity Church because there's real people here honest people right uh, and as we go out in the world and make a mess of our life God when we come back, he doesn't, he's not vindictive, he's not, he's not there to beat us up, right? He welcomes us with open arms. Um, and so we then, Jason talked about adoption, right? How we're adopted into a family. Our family uh, on earth is most of us, right? If you're here at Gravity Church on a Saturday night, our families are broken, right? And we've experienced pain and suffering, but we've been adopted into a family that's different. We have a family that is spiritual. We have, a, we have a father that is perfect. We have a father that loves us, right? And he has a plan for us. So Jason talked about how God entrusts us with his kingdom, right? We're not just uh, laborers in a field, right? We, we've been given dominion. We've been given authority. We've been given something to do. And he, from the beginning of time, he had a plan for us, and he trusts us, and he gives us something to do. Um, and so that's our father. We have a father that loves us, that searches for us, that runs after us, that welcomes us back with open arms. And we have a father that entrusts us with his creation, with his world, right, with his children. He entrusts me with his daughter, my wife, Becky, Right? He entrusts us, and, and that is a wonderful father, unlike many of the fathers we've probably had here on earth. And so we're going to keep talking tonight about the father's love. 
So uh, let's start in the book of Ephesians. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Think about that. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. According to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of our trespass according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So Paul tells us that before the foundation of the world, before God created anything, he chose us, right? He knew you before the earth was formed, before that little moon was circling around the earth. He knew you, and the Bible says from the very beginning, he chose you. He wants you to be a part of his family, right? And he knew he's all-knowing. God is all-knowing. He knows everything across. He he's, exists outside of time. And so it wasn't like he said, provisionally, I choose Jonathan. We'll see how he does in the first 20 years of his life, and then I'll make a final verdict, right? No, he knew. He knew that I would rebel against him. He knew all of the craziness that I would be involved in, and he still chose us, Right? And it says that in love, he predestined us for adoption, right? And we can argue after church about predestination, right? I don't want to argue about it with you on stage, but the argument about predestination and free will and all that misses the point, I think, right? The point is that God has a plan for your life, right? He predestined you for something, He knew what he wanted for you to do. He knew what he wanted your life to be like. He knew the love and the grace and the mercy that he wanted to give you from the very beginning. And so he predestined us to be adopted into his family, right? To be sons and daughters, to be co-heirs with Jesus Christ. And that's the love that he has for us. Um, Paul talks about it again in uh, Galatians, so flip back to, or not Galatians, sorry, Romans. I don't know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Romans chapter 8, he explains uh, some more of this uh, idea that God knew us before the beginning of time. If you read, Romans is an amazing book, if you read like Romans 6, 7, and 8, it talks about how we pretty much screw everything up, right? Right? Um, so if you, if you want some sympathy, if you, if you want to feel like you're in part of the story, read Romans 6, 7, and 8, because there we are making a mess of things, right? But God, in his grace and his mercy, he comes and he sorts it out. And so uh, Romans 8, 28, he says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose, So that's where we normally stop and we print the t-shirt, we put it on the coffee mug, right? We stop there and we say, God works everything for good. I'm going to get the job. My girlfriend's going to marry me. My finances are going to be amazing, right? I'm going to be able to buy the house. God works all things for good. And then we, we go on our way. But he defines, Paul defines the good that God is doing. He tells us what the good is. And this is what it is. So he says in verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, right? That's what we've been talking about. God chose us before the world was created. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined 
to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So God foreknew us and he predestined us. But he, he, he didn't just predestine us to have a, a good car and a good job and a, and a happy marriage, right? Those are good things, but that is not what God predestined us to be. God predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son, right? He predestined us to be like Jesus Christ. And so if you're looking in the mirror and you get up in the morning and you say, I don't really like the person I'm looking at. I have good news for you because Jesus Christ sacrificed himself and God sent him so that he could turn you into something else, so that he can conform you, he can shape you and mold you. And then he says that we are brothers of Christ. Now think about that. Jesus, uh, in, in John, it talks about how when Jesus spoke Everything came into existence by Jesus, right? He literally created everything. Uh, he, that's a powerful dude, right? How many of you have said uh, uh, exist and things exist, right? I've tried before in my uh, addiction. I tried to manifest things, right, into existence. It doesn't work, by the way. Sorry. Uh, things don't magically pop into existence out of nothing unless you're God and then you make them happen. But he says that we are brothers of Christ. So he, he predestined you to turn you into the image of his son and bring you into his family so that you would be brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. So Jesus, our Savior, the one that is perfect, the one that is pure, the one that is good, the one that was able to carry all of our sin, that Jesus is your brother, is your, is your family. And we have a place at his table Right, we, we spend so much time in this world looking for belonging, looking for acceptance. I just, if this girl would just like me and give me her phone number, if my boss would just appreciate me enough, if my father would just say nice things to me, right, if the people in the world would just recognize, uh, you know, the value that I have, and we, we, we spend so much time searching for that acceptance, searching for that belonging, but here it is. God in heaven from the beginning of time says, you have a place at my table. You have a place in my family. You are my son and my daughter, and I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done, and I don't care what people have done to you, because I am shaping you. I am conforming you into the image of my son, Jesus Christ. And that's a beautiful picture, because we have a place Right? If you're looking for a place tonight, you have found it. Your place is at the table of your heavenly father who loves you and sacrificed his son for you and is creating a space for you. Right? And it says he has a name for you and he's going to give you a new body and he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. He's making things new for us. You have a place in Jesus tonight. So what does it look like? What does it mean to be conformed? Right? What does that, that picture uh, mean? Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 18. And he gives us a picture of this process. So God loves us. He, he predestined us. He foreknew us. He has a plan for us. He's calling us into his family. But he doesn't stop there, right? It says that he's changing us. He's conforming us. And the picture that he gives us is a, a potter shaping clay, right? Has anybody been to, like, one of the pottery places in town where you go and you try to make a mug? It's actually hard work. I can't do it. Let's read Jeremiah 18, uh, starting at verse 1. He says, The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was at his, working at his wheel. So you've got the big wheel that spins, and they put the water on, and they shape it and shape it and shape it. I'm sure you've seen something on Facebook or some meme about it. They're all over the place. 
He says, and the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand. And so there's this picture of a potter shaping a clay, and, and the thing that he's made is spoiled, right? It's broken. It's not shaped right, right? It's not going to function the way it was intended to function. Maybe there's a hole, like if you're making a vase to put some flowers in, but there's a big hole in the bottom, right? And, and if you pour water in that hole, or in, that, in the top, it's just going to drain out of the hole, right? So it's this picture of this, this thing that's being shaped, but it's broken. It's spoiled. It's not right. Something's wrong with it. And he doesn't just say, okay, I'm going to sell this at the dollar store or at a flea market, right? It, he changes it. It says, and he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good for the potter to do. So it is good for God to change us. He doesn't just leave us in our brokenness. He doesn't leave us in our despair. He calls us to him. He welcomes us into his family. And then he begins to change us, right? And change is sometimes hard. Have you seen a potter when they're doing that little shaping? What happens when it doesn't work out right? They collapse the whole thing in. So it's like shaping and shaping and shaping. Okay, it's not working, and they collapse the whole thing in and start over, right? And so it's this picture of God shaping us and stretching us and molding us, and he's pushing this part over here, and he's smoothing this out, and he's scraping this, and he's stretching this, right? And he's reshaping us into something that is better, something that is good, something that he intended us to be. What does that look like practically in our lives today? Um, let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. And Paul explains how this works uh, in, in the lives of believers today. And I want to encourage you, as we, we've been talking for a couple weeks about this analogy of the Father and um, at Gravity Church, sometimes that analogy breaks down. But I want you to set aside your father. If you had a wonderful father, then stick with the analogy. Praise God. But if you had a broken relationship, if your father was gone, you need to picture like that TV relationship of the father who really loved their kid and was there for them, right? Because that's the analogy that Paul is giving us. And in a second, I'll give you another analogy that maybe will help uh, put things in perspective. So Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verse 1. He says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. So picture a, a, beautiful, a wonderful father, a loving father that cares about every aspect of your life. This is the father that he's talking about. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. He disciplines the one that he loves. Jason talked about the difference between discipline and punishment, right? He's not talking about beating us down. The Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the father, whom his father does not discipline? Listen to verse 8. If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, 
then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Think about that for a second. First of all, discipline is love, right? This is the conforming process. This is what it looks like. God comes to us and he says, I'm going to change you. And the way that he changes us is by giving us the Holy Spirit. We're indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And he begins to convict us of our sin. And he says, okay, I want you to begin to change. I want you to start surrendering these areas of your life to me. He disciplines the ones that he loves. And verse 8 says that if he didn't, if God wasn't disciplining you, then you would be an illegitimate children, a child, right? Without discipline, we're illegitimate children of God. And so it's very important that we accept the discipline that God has for us, right? Because that is the way that he shows his love. It's the way that he conforms us into his image. Now, you might say, John, I thought God is love and and God accepts me as I am, right? God loves us. You know, the Bible does say that God is love. That's true. Um, God welcomes us as he is, right? But he loves us enough to change us, right? Welcoming us into his family isn't the same as accepting our behavior, The Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet his enemy, he went to the cross for us, right? The Bible isn't telling us that we should be enemies of God. The Bible isn't telling us that we should be sinners. It's saying that God welcomed us into his family despite the things that we have done. He loves us. He invites us, but then he begins to change us. He conforms us into the image of his son. He wants to make you whole. Right? He doesn't, he doesn't want to just welcome you in and say, stay in your dysfunction. When I came to this church 11 years ago, I was broken. I was addicted. I was strung out. I was anxious. I was depressed, and I was suicidal. I was done with life. I was at the end of my rope. I was a lunatic. I had been on every single anti-medication you could think of, antipsychotics, antidepressants, anti-anxiety, mood stabilizers. I had been on it all. The only thing I didn't do was let them shock my brain right? And I came into the church and I experienced the grace of God. And what kind of father would see me bowing and kneeling at his altar and say, I'm going to leave you like that. He doesn't want to leave you broken. He sees that the vessel is spoiled and he wants to change it. He wants to conform you into the image of his son. And that is beautiful. Um, I, need a, I need a volunteer. Will you come up for a second? I want to give you another analogy. Did you play basketball when you were younger? Good, good, that, that's better. So uh, here you go, this is for you. Uh, what is that? That's a basketball. So I'll, if you can't see, so uh, I have my, my, uh, my sports, sports athlete here, and she's, uh, she's going to learn to play basketball, and I'm going to be her coach, right? And so... Uh, the first thing I'm going to do as your coach is to tell you to get a real basketball because that thing's pathetic. But anyways, that's what we have. Yeah, just, just good. Just that we're going to start off good. All right, so uh, do you know how to do like a free throw? Okay, so hold that pose right now. Um, okay, now that's probably not the greatest free throw pose. Let's just be honest. I'm sorry, right? Now, what... What kind of coach would I be if I said, yeah, just go ahead. Bye. What kind of coach would I be if I I saw somebody getting ready to throw a free throw and I didn't tell them, okay, like, I don't know how to play basketball. I can't coach basketball. It's a terrible (laughs) analogy. Right? But straighten your arms, you know, work on technique, get your form down. Right? Right? The, the point of a coach is to help a player be successful in the game of basketball, right? So that you could win basketball games. And a coach would be a terrible coach if he saw you just slouching around, you know, just kind of oh, whatever, and he didn't come and say, okay, like, we're going to work, we're going to train. I-, I need you to do some run, run laps around the church, you know, do some push-ups, right? We're going we're gonna to drill. Thank you. That, that is what God is doing for us. 
And so if, if you had a difficult father, if you had a difficult family, maybe think about God in this term, right? As somebody that wants you uh, to be successful. He wants you to fulfill the purpose. He wants to conform you into the image of his son. And the way that he does that is by changing you, is by shaping you. And sometimes it's painful, right? Sometimes it's difficult. We are sinful people, and we're, in, we're involved in all kinds of craziness and sin, and it's difficult to let go of that. And sometimes we're challenged, but it's for our good, right? It's for our good. He wants us to grow. He wants us to be like Jesus. He wants to perfect us. Um, let's look at First uh, John real quick. First John chapter 3. He says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, he's talking about you, beloved. We are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. We haven't seen it yet. It hasn't walked the earth. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. That's talking about Jesus. And it says when Jesus comes back and he walks this earth and he calls us to himself, it says that we will be like him. We don't know what it looks like yet. We can't see it fully. We've only seen a picture, a glimpse Paul says it's like looking in a foggy mirror or through a glass dimly, right? We, we don't have a complete picture of it, but he is making us into Jesus Christ. And the way that he does that is through his discipline, by purifying us, by shaping us. And so we're challenged in our society today. We're challenged because the devil wants you to believe that love is the same as affirmation, that love is the same as agreement, that if, if somebody loves you, they will allow you to be in the same condition that you're in, right? Like that coach that says, okay, just do whatever. We're all, you made it on the team. We'll see you at the banquet, right? Why is it that the devil wants us to believe this? There's two reasons. The first reason is because he wants to divide us. He wants us to hate each other. He wants us to think, if you don't accept my brokenness, then you hate me. He wants to drive a wedge in between us. But more than that, and this breaks my heart, Satan wants you to reject God's discipline so that you will be an illegitimate child of God. The reason he wants you to believe this, the reason that he causes so much division and so much bitterness and anger, and the reason that he's working so hard in our society to say that acceptance and affirmation is love is so that when God comes to you and says, stop the way that you're living, you will reject him. He wants you to think that God hates you. He wants to think that God is a vindictive God up in heaven because he wants to separate you from your father. He's trying to divide us. He's trying to create this separation. He wants to cut you off from the love of your father. And he does it with a simple belief that love is acceptance. God loved me when I was running through the woods praying to animals doing drugs. God loved me when I was telling my best friend in high school that he was a stupid Bible thumper and trying to get drugs into his system without him knowing. God loved me when I was his enemy. Love does not equal acceptance. Love is what God has for us. Love says, I want to change you. I want to make you new. It's the potter shaping us and conforming us and making us something better. And I believe tonight that there are many people that are in this situation where we've been rejected by by man. We've been hurt by people who say, you're not good enough. 
you're too ugly, you're too fat, you're too stupid. And we've lived in a, in a church culture where we feel like we could never measure up. I could never be good enough for God to accept me. And that is a lie. That is a lie from the pit of hell. God loves you and he wants to accept you. He, he wants to welcome you into his family and he wants to change you. He wants to make you whole and complete. So how does he do that? How, how, do, how do we deal with this belief that we're, we're no good, we can never measure up? Paul gives us a roadmap in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. He says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse, uh, starting in verse 11, he says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. Three times, Paul, when he's talking about the attack of the enemy, right? And the, the main way that the enemy attacks us is by lying to us, by telling us we're no good, we'll never measure up, we'll never belong, we'll never be a part of anything, right? Right? And the way that he tells us to deal with this is to stand. He says, stand firm. Put on the armor of God so that you can stand. He wants you to stand. And so I'm going to invite you tonight. If, if you've been rejected by people, if you've been rejected and hurt by the, your friends, your family, your community, by your church, if you struggle with believing that there's a God in heaven that loves you, if you had a, a horrible earthly family and this idea of God in heaven loving us is difficult for you, then I want you to stand up. I want you to stand because God tells us to stand. This is the way that we deal. This is the way that we fight back. We stand up and we say, I don't care what you say to me, devil. I don't care what you say to me, Satan. I know the truth. The Bible says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We stand firm. It doesn't say that we have to do anything magnificent, right? It says that all we have to do is stand, stand firm, put on the truth, put on salvation, and stand. Put your feet on the ground and say, I will not be moved by your lies. I do not believe what you are telling me. You are lying to me, and I see your lies, and I will stand. So that's the first thing that we do. We stand. We're going to look at one more scripture. Stay standing with me. Stay standing while I slowly flip my Bible. James tells us in chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 7, he says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If you are standing tonight, what you are doing is resisting the devil. You're saying, I don't care what you have said about me. I don't care what my earthly father has said. I don't care what my teachers have said. I don't care what my relationships have said. I am standing in the love of my father. He says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And then he says in verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, 
you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. He says, recognize the brokenness. Mourn, weep over it. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. The Bible says to draw near to God and he will draw near to you. If you are broken tonight, if you are hurting tonight, you have an opportunity to draw near to God. He is waiting for you. You can come to this altar and you can kneel at the altar and you can pray and you can say to God, I accept your love. You can say to your father, like Jason said, I will call you my father. I accept your adoption. I recognize myself as your son or your daughter. We have communion on the corners here tonight. Take communion and tell God, tell your father that you accept his love, that you embrace your position in his family. Reject the lie of the devil. Accept the love of your father. Draw near to him tonight, and he will draw near to you, and he will take your brokenness, and the Bible says that he will exalt you in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you that even though we're broken, that the story's not over. God, I thank you that even though we were enemies of yours, that we were rejecting you, that we were pushing you away, that you chose us. From the beginning of earth, before the foundations of the earth, you knew me, you predestined me. God, I pray that we would know that truth tonight. I pray that we would know the love that you have for us, a love that is eternal, a love that started before the beginning of time itself, a love that will carry on into eternity. I pray that we would know that love tonight. And I pray that that love would set us free from the lies of the devil. It would set us free from his schemes. God, I pray as we accept and receive and know the love that you have for us, that it would give us the courage to resist to stand, to stand in your truth, to stand in the relationship that you have with us. Father, I pray you would bless these people, that you would bless them in the name of Jesus. Amen.